Hey, it's Alexis Haynes, and this is my podcast, Recovering from Reality. I am so excited about this episode. I know I've been hinting to you guys over the last several months about the amazing um, opportunity that we had to sit down as a family with Michelle Kimbolis, who's an incredible marriage and family therapist, and um, my family, the girls from Pretty Wild. If you guys didn't watch us on Pretty Wild, Pretty Wild was a reality TV show that we were on back in 2009 on E! And uh, it was my mom, Andrea, and my sisters, Gabrielle and Tess, and myself um, navigating Hollywood and all of the chaos that that brought. So I'm so excited to sit down with you guys. I feel like this, we're all in a place now where things certainly aren't perfect, but they're a lot better than they used to be. And I am, I'm really excited to sit down with you guys. I think this is the first time that you've all been together um, with cameras on since that mm -hmm. time. <laughs> okay, so what is that like? Intimidating. Uh -huh. <laughs> thrilling, absolutely Exciting. thrilling. <laughs> um, it's 10 years later and uh, it's, it's different, but uh, it's exciting. I'm excited to share where we are now and, and yeah, ex explore a little bit more together and yeah. I think it's really nice because when we were filming our show, it was so chaotic and just constant drama and how can we create more and more drama. And now I feel like we're a little bit more in control of this environment and I feel a little bit more empowered yeah. mm. and I feel safer to be together and to be in the space and to be authentically us. Well, it's interesting that you chose to sit down with a family therapist. You created an environment that was going to be emotionally safe and very different to yeah. what you experienced earlier on uh, when you were teens. Now, I understand it's a show business, but in a lot of ways, our emotional instability was taken taken advantage of in, in so many ways. Yes, I mean, absolutely. They really, <laughs> they really got it all on film, didn't they? It worked as good. Yeah. They sure did. So, I love so it. Gabby, talk, talk about that. What, what stands out for you when you, when you think about um, that time? Um, I think about uh, the storylines that they pushed on us. Uh, like? You know, the more drama, the better. And I totally understand that. But there's also a line of sympathy that I think we, we did lack. Yeah. Empathy. The, the, yeah. yeah. Empathy. They didn't yeah. have any of it for us. Um, and I think that in, in, the, uh, in the midst of it all, we just, we really needed that. And instead they chose to, to really yes. highlight all of the bad things, yeah, that were happening in our, in our household. I really so, think about the time, the, the very, the famous meme that everyone tags me in all the time real? of Nancy Toe, this is Which Alexis is so... Nyers calling. <laughs> and I, I laugh about it because it, well, it is funny in hindsight, absolutely. But when, well, but it was horrible in the moment, but, but, but it wasn't that escalated in the beginning. It was, that was take, take after, after take, take yes. after take mm. after like take. 36 times. We did it over and over and over and over. And that's the end result. All you was saw the was the blow up. With yeah. the blow up. I had to go, keep going to the next scene and do the next thing and keep pushing well, and going and going. Had any tools at that time. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. tools, yeah. strategies to hear each other out. There is a scene that I remember watching where um, it was your sweet 16 birthday party. <laughs> and was you it a had whore party? And you had, you thought it was a whore party. It was very upsetting to Tessa you. Tessa Alexis is and Italian you, whore party. And um, you arranged for a DJ to come. And, and that DJ was a victim of one of the burglaries. And you were devastated. You were crushed and so vulnerable and quite shaken. I don't know if you remember that. And you I wanted do. to set a boundary. You wanted some distance. You wanted the cameras to um, well, leave you alone. Well, they did that on purpose. They did that to us. So <laughs> That's the thing, is that right. you're constantly reacting to things they're doing to you. they're doing to you. So yeah. we did not choose Paul Oakenfold. That was <laughs> shot 
after they chose Paul Oakenfold to yeah. be my DJ, none of us knew that he was attacked by the bling ring, and uh, they did that as another thing to, you know, stir, get a stir reaction, the <laughs> start the reaction. And I remember but. feeling so heartbroken that they did that to us. Just another way they wanted to humiliate us. Um, the Nancy Jo thing, Alexis would have never taken that interview had it not been for our crew who told us to take the Vanity Fair uh, interview and that they were going to portray Alexis in this great light. At the same time, I really feel like we, I, I was feeling my, I was going through so much and I was trying to pretend to be someone that at the time I really wasn't, was, the, was a good person deep down inside of me, absolutely. But I wasn't authentically a very good person at that time and so I was fighting so very hard for everyone to perceive me as a good person and I think we can all we feel all that do. when yeah. we're, you know, and you've got to, and it's like that mirror was slowly cracking and I could feel every single little crack. And then at one point it just shattered. And that was the moment that it shattered where I was like, there is no hope. There, this story is so far gone, there is no hope. And despite the fact that I wasn't really the leader of the bling ring and the way that the media portrayed it, mm -hmm. um, I, I, it didn't, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing um, at the time was was for me to get help and for me to get better and for me to be like authentic and right. honest about my experience and the right. things that I was struggling with. But there was no room for that because we were constantly battling tabloid after tabloid after tabloid of stuff going on. Yeah. So it yes. was just, and, and not yeah. to say that that wasn't a mess of my own making, it absolutely was. I mean, I think we were all a little bit naive and we didn't really realize what we were signing up for when we signed up to do reality TV. You yeah. were young, you were battling addiction and you needed help. Yeah, Yeah. and a life full of trauma. Right. So yeah. it's just like, yeah. we are the perfect and ideal people to be on reality right. TV 100%. for them. Mm -hmm. But like, we're because not. Because you were vulnerable. Yes. Yeah. Where did you feel the most vulnerable? during that time? I, th I mean, I guess through the whole entire thing, I didn't have many tools of, yeah, I don't. To cope. To cope with any of it, yeah, it was all, it was a lot. And um, my addiction definitely kept me feeling comfortable and safe in that environment. I used it to like numb myself, to feel comfortable yeah. doing what? everything. I. When we spoke earlier, um, you were feeling quite triggered. Yeah. And, and you talked about how the, the way that you coped with all of the pressure and all of the, you know, just the, the difficulty of mm -hmm. being under the camera's eye is that you would go to the bathroom and you would shoot up. Yeah, we and were. And here you are this morning mm -hmm. facing some of those pressures. Yeah. Healthy. Yeah. So, yeah. That's got to feel it's different. amazing. It's yeah, it, amazing it's and it's different. It's different, yeah. So okay. the first time in front of cameras, like sober. That's you so know, funny not you numb. That's amazing. So yeah. <laughs> and I also heard you um, really questioning whether or not people would like this version of you. Yeah, it's like super mellow and like tame, kind of just like <laughs> boring, like not something that people would. I feel like people would want to watch. Yeah. And that's okay now. I'm okay with that now. So. Well, I love this yeah. version, <laughs> this healthy version. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. me too. That's so funny because uh, earlier today when we went through this dispute, uh, I left and I went and hung out with some of my friends who lived down the street and I said to myself, you know, I used to smoke pot to numb this pain and I chose to process that today without wanting to go to a substance mm. to just be here and yeah and be here and say if I do this again and if I just smoke a bowl and forget about it it's still there the pain is still there it's just pushed down deeper and uh, I'm I'm proud of all of us Gabby, I'm so proud of you mm -hmm. because you are not depending on a strategy that has a fallout that's really unhealthy. Your strategies yeah. today are to stand 
and to, and to go within and ask yourself, what do I really need here? And, and honoring that before then responding to the situation and not making it blow up even bigger than it already had, but right. taking the time to process it. And I did blow it up. I, I blow up. I blow up. I get angry. Um, and I used to only know how to suppress that anger with, with pot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm you learning. have new coping tools and it's yes. of no surprise that um, many of you were really highly activated this morning mm -hmm. because um, this is an environment with all of the it's triggers of the situation. cameras yeah. and, and so on um, that would unconsciously take you right back to those places of trauma. Mm -hmm. That's really why I wanted to do this to provide a platform for us to share our experiences and where we're at now and to have like an honest discussion about our family dynamic and our family system in a way that we want it to be told. Yeah. You know what I for mean? For once. Yes. For once. Right. For us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this is a platform for all of us to come together and I'm really grateful that you came back because I want that for you too. Like yeah. everybody deserves to have their perspective and their point of view heard and acknowledged and, and I think that that's so important like whether we agree with everything or not you know how does a family that was that dysfunctional Function. move into a place of functioning Functionally. one of the things that i really wanted to talk about was early recovery mm. really wanted to talk about early recovery because early recovery was different for all of us it was different for the parent it was and it was different for each of the kids so i was the first person to get sober. Um, and when I went into treatment, um, it was really hard because I felt like I was going at it alone because everybody else was still getting loaded. Everybody else was still getting loaded. And the same dysfunctionality was taking place where I was trying to constantly rescue and shame Tess. If you really loved me, you'd get sober. Why aren't you getting sober? Why can't you get sober for me? If I can do, do it, why this? can't you? I remember this. I had to make an amends to her. It mm. was like the most... It's a big part of recovery. <laughs> Start crying. It was like the most powerful thing because she continued to get loaded for like two years after I got sober. And we were through thick and through thin like Take a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> Take a tissue. These uh, these two were like gas and fire. Yeah, but like know? thicker. Like we had been through yeah. everything. So, so much, much together. Much together. Yeah. So much together. So, you know, uh, I I had kept trying to get Tess to get sober, get sober, get sober. And I kept putting her into treatment centers when she was not ready. <laughs> I was just, yeah. She was not all ready. I wasn't done. She was not done. Mm -hmm. And um, I called Bob Forrest, who is a mentor of mine and just an all-around amazing guy. And he's got like 20 plus years sober. Wait, can we just interject here that I had tried to hire a Navy SEAL team to go in and extract well, her. So you <laughs> all worked really hard. It was like to, an to, army against yeah, me. It was like an to army get better. Against. So what, Except me. when was the... I sat on the sidelines. Yeah. Tell well, me about the, the pivotal point. When I was done? When were you done? I was going to die is what it comes down to. It was like a life or death thing for me and I was finally just tired. You know, I just didn't want to do it anymore. Who did it's you just, call? My dad. You called your dad. Mm -hmm. He stayed out of it for most of it. Mm -hmm. And then finally I was just like, hey, I'm ready. I'm done. And he picked me up and he flew me to Wisconsin. Or he drove me to Wisconsin and I detoxed in the back of his car. Wow. And um, here I am. Yeah. Yay. I think that. Yeah. <laughs> but I yeah. do think that Bob's impact really played a role because yeah. what happened was Bob, we Tessa's dad wanted to intervene. He called uh, myself and my mom and said we need help Tess mm -hmm. you know and we're like okay again what are we gonna do my mom's hiring the Navy SEALs <laughs> not kidding not kidding not kidding we're gonna get her out of that we're gonna tent. Get her you out. have connections yes yeah, she does <laughs> in other words she does so she's she's going on this whole thing I called Bob I'm like Bob we've got to do an intervention we've got they're gonna go in the there and Navy get her the Navy SEALs are gonna get her and, and Bob goes no you're not he goes you are here to do nothing except for to apologize for all of the times that you forced her into sobriety when she wasn't ready, when you tried to take away the one thing that kept all of the pain away when mm -hmm. she wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. And we sat at that table and he goes, and at the end you may offer her treatment and if she's not ready, you will ask her to lunch next week. And I said, okay. 
She came in, she was tweaking, 80 pounds. I was like, oh, oh my God. God, I'm looking at a skeleton who's like, she couldn't even eat. She was just like tweaking, like just twitching and could not function and could not. But I had one moment with her. <laughs> <laughs> eye to eye and I was able to make like a real immense like a real immense to her for all all of it mm. she just cried and I <laughs> cried and I held her it was funny because I was probably like 200 pounds and she was 80 <laughs> <laughs> so it was like I was hugging a stick <laughs> with my big old belly, uh -huh. my big pregnant that belly, and my big very body. Feeling tender it moments. was, it was, and I felt like, and because Bob always says, if you want to be, if the the person that's always harping on you and griping on you isn't going to be the person that you call when you ready to, when you're ready to get sober, they're going to be you're going to be the last person they call. How is your life different now? <laughs> my life today, there's mm -hmm. like no comparison at all. My life is very quiet and mellow. I live in a really small town. Um, You're a mom. I'm a mom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. <coughs> I can't compare the two. Yeah. yeah. So that sounds very balanced, mm -hmm. very healthy. It's very normal. And very normal. Very normal. <laughs> Which, like, how do you, so that's the question is how do you obtain normality mm, <laughs> when right. you come from, when you come from this? And it, and it's, doesn't all come at once it's no it it's, took years and it's definitely still something we're all trying to figure out but yeah, it's a be, lot better what does your normal look like well so I didn't really have normal until about <laughs> like three years ago mm. um, I was in a very dysfunctional relationship for three years mm. of emotional abuse and physical abuse and uh, no one could get me out of it uh, except for myself. I had to go through my own process. So when the girls were processing and, and going through everything, I just had to, I almost felt like I had to just be a rock that didn't move, didn't grow, didn't, didn't do much because I was just, I was scared. Of you any, didn't want to cause more disruption. Right, exactly. And I have to say that because of watching my sisters crumble and fall, I didn't crumble and fall. I saw what that side of life looked like. You got really determined, didn't and you? And I, yeah, I got determined. Well, you had lots of partying phases. I did, like but lots. I didn't, but different. But totally different, totally different. Um, like I party, for sure, I still party, I still like to have a good time, um, but I never wanted to have destruction in my life. And so therefore, I would try and, uh, well I would, I would, uh, I would turn it off when I needed to turn it off. And do you think you tried to make other choices because you saw yes, how much suffering for sure, for sure. Um, I your wanted, sisters were going through? Yeah, I, I didn't want to be anything like that. I didn't want to have to feel that pain for sure. I saw, I saw it th with them. And I also think I've lacked a lot of understanding for what they have gone through. I'm lucky to have never been through the trauma that they went through. You know, you know when I was watching the episodes, um, I, I saw scenes where you were, you know, looking for your dog, and and your dog had gone missing, mm -hmm. and they were where really you just were, hiding the where you brought where you're brought to tears, and I saw a little girl who was actually quite traumatized. I I was. I mean, of course, how could I not be? What, what my sisters didn't understand and what my mom was a little bit blinded to was this was going international. No one, I don't think, was thinking about the fact that this was airing every Sunday and that my boyfriend's family was going to turn it on the TV and laugh at us and joke about how horrible and, oh, God, just all of the, it was all going live. I, I wanted everyone to be my friends. I remember that I wanted an outlet that wasn't my family so that I felt like I had a family. And I went to go find that. And I, I did find that in a good group of friends. Um, but yeah, I was very codependent. I wanted everyone to love me because I didn't feel very loved. You wanted everyone to love you? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I felt Have a lot. Have you found that sense within yourself? I, f I love myself for the first time, I think, ever. And it just sort of came a few months ago, actually. 
I just started sticking up for myself. You found boundaries. I am still looking for those boundaries, but yes, I found a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I know that I need to set a lot of a lot of boundaries. Um, I let people take advantage of me because I want their love, because I want their acceptance. Um, that's been a huge part of my life and something that I definitely struggle with still today. But uh, yeah, actually my husband has taught me <laughs> to, oh, to, get a to tissue. love myself. Get a tissue. <laughs> no, to love myself because through his unconditional love for me, I saw that I was worthy. Yeah. Love and connection and healthy relationships can activate something so well, powerful did within with us for sure okay so let's let's talk about that um i'm i'm so curious to know how your relationships with your mom andrea um has changed since that time you're women now yeah. <laughs> your mother daughter Mine, relationship must be very yeah, different it is in the beginning in my early recovery there the, she was very um she wanted to manage every aspect of my life in early recovery. She mm -hmm. wanted to have control over everything. And we know that that comes from just feeling constantly out of control. Yeah. And, um, and she wasn't, she had her narrative and she was sticking to it and she wasn't open um, to hearing anything else for those first couple of years. And and I'm, I really say I'm lucky to be sober today, <laughs> making it through that oh, early. Oh, God, I was the worst. When she first got sober, I felt like, oh, my God, all of a sudden I don't have anybody to conquer and control. Mm. And I had to finally look at myself and my own sadness and my own, the void that was, that was, driving me all of my own life. I left home when I was 14. I didn't have a family of origin that felt safe for me. I didn't feel loved. And so my entire life, like Gabby was sharing, I was listening to her going, oh yeah, I can relate to that. I felt very much like these girls filled my void. And when Alexis first got into recovery, I was like, oh my God, she's gone and you were gone and you mm -hmm. were in school and my marriage was failing and all of a sudden I had to look at myself and go what's going on but instead of but looking at myself I didn't yeah. look at myself until I had I yeah. almost freaking destroyed my relationship permanently with my daughter yeah I was so I was so toxic to her I was angry and shaming and I felt violated by all the things that she had done which instead of looking at what my part was, I was still very much focused on making her the scapegoat. Our children come into our life because we're meant to learn through them. So yeah. whatever unfinished business we have emotionally, psychologically, is going to show up and play oh, yeah. out oh, through yeah. our relationship mm -hmm. with our child. So uh, it's an invitation to become conscious. Well, yeah. she was my greatest teacher for sure. And yeah, all of them. But Alexis was yeah. the one who finally said to me, Mom, if I got off heroin and I'm not on any kind of medication or, or other drugs, don't you think you could quit smoking weed and get off of antidepressants? And I was like, yeah, I could probably get off the antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was not willing to give up. The, <laughs> the weed. What do you want the girls to know today? I'm so sorry. And I'm so I, sorry for not being healthy and not getting the help I needed because I was not able to support you in what you needed. And you guys at that point to me were my rock. You were my rock. And I should have been the adult and I should have been the parent that was your rock. I think that that's what we really needed to hear is like, we know the history, we know the experiences that she's been through, but just to acknowledge that like, we weren't really ever given the opportunity to be kids. We, we knew about every financial struggle that we ever, that we ever went into. We knew about the credit card debt. We knew we weren't able to afford toilet paper at sometimes. We had Christmases where we rewrapped our own presents because nothing was going to be under the tree and we knew it. And I feel like I just need to, to hear like, I didn't step up to the plate in the way that I needed to, because like, I look at the way I would do that as a mom, if I was in that position now where we were financially struggling and blah, 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 my kids would still be kids. I would go 
stand in line for hours to get presents wherever. And my kids would never know the, you know, the degree of like financial hardship and all that because they're kids. And I felt like she just, you didn't have the boundaries back then to know like that your kids aren't your friends and they don't need to know all of the issues, yeah. you know? I think that Do my mom used us to help her because mm -hmm. she didn't have anyone totally. and she was so lonely and she didn't know what to do or where to go. I heard, yeah. I heard you both say, mom, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you forgive your mom? I do. No, a hundred percent. It, it, and I'm just saying it feels good to hear that acknowledgement of like, at the end of the day, like I fucked it up. This is, um, a very <laughs> powerful way for you to be the voice of healing, transformation, recovery, resilience, yeah. and give hope to other families who are going through their, their yes. own struggles. Yes. And every family struggles in their own way. I mean, if we could get through the humiliation of Pretty Wild, then we could get through anything. I mean, and you can get through anything. So, yeah. I'm so grateful. But let's let's talk about what the show really was, okay? Because we got signed on to do a show yes. called Homeschool, Homeschool with, with the Arlingtons, Arlingtons okay? And the, really? the whole show was supposed to be about me homeschooling the children <laughs> using the law of attraction to help them work promo? in the film industry. That was what the whole premise of this show was supposed to be. And then on the first day of filming, second day, second, second day, day of filming, the police showed up <laughs> and arrested Alexis. Cameras off. By for being a part of this bling ring. Which of course Burglary. we reshot for dramatic effect. So yeah. this no. happened before you started shooting. But but the uh, but the show followed it uh, throughout its course. Right, they had to switch the whole storyline because I that see. Yeah. It's Talk crazy. about sliding doors. <laughs> yeah. What? Talk about sliding doors. Uh -huh. That life can change very, very quickly. It did. Honestly, like like I said that the bling ring I don't regret it I don't care to change my story not, not change my story but for people to hear all of that because it's like those were the that was the best thing that ever happened to me going to jail those two times like I would not be here I would be six feet under I kid you not with she the amount of overdosing and over test overdosing in my arms before you know it, it sounds to me like in going through every hardship that you've described, including the burglary and, mm. and being caught up in the whole legal end, was the unfolding of your lives in a way that has become really meaningful. Yeah. Well, it like it made everything so it could all unravel. So that way we were like at a base floor and we could, the only way was up. Up. up the or only you're way die. was you're up. You're either going to die or we're going to move through this like right. that so was it what do you want families to know who may be struggling with addiction or have a family member that's struggling with addiction what i want people to know is that even if you have a messy family um getting better is possible you know that that it's possible to work on family dynamics to be honest you know, to be to have honest conversations about about things that aren't really that healthy or that are toxic that are going on, and to be able to mend those things, it, it is possible, and um, it starts with individual recovery, and then as a family unit, you are able to come together and to start working and to start healing, and I think that. Um, I hope that's what listeners got as a major takeaway today. And um, yeah, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful that you guys all came here today. I'm grateful for you, Michelle. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I look forward to having you guys on the podcast again soon, I hope.